Hey there, guys. Just a short, not-so-subtle pre-show reminder from your humble host that you're listening to the free first hour of this here THC episode, and we do reserve the second hour of each episode for Plus members, though I don't usually waste your time with ads or plugs. But if you're curious enough to hear more, you can now get a free seven-day trial membership by filling out the short form at the bottom of the page on the HiresideChats.com. So treat yourself, and maybe, fingers crossed, you'll stick around. If it works for Netflix, it should work for me, right? Now let's get this ride moving. The planet's puppet masters almost surely have a plan. This clearly may be something there beyond the realm of man. And until you thoroughly tested every last close just a few, I find the more you think you know, the less you really do. That's true, Dr. Zayas. Very well. Where would we be without THC? Well, well, well. Welcome, Higher Side Chatters. Drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke from sunny San Diego. I am your humble host, Greg Carlwood. And for the most part, I've stopped prefacing the show so we can get right into the interviews. This is what we're here for. But I do want to give you just a little bit of context for today's talk with Daniel Pinchbeck. We recorded this interview bright and early on the morning after Election Day, so it hadn't even been confirmed that Trump had won until I woke up, and I was still in disbelief. Maybe I still am. I know the news was fresh for Daniel, too. I think he was the first person I even spoke to about it besides my special lady. And while I'm no Trump supporter, and you'd have to be pretty naive to think he's not the puppet of some other hidden hand in the game of Power Pyramid Thrones that goes on behind the scenes, I chose then and still do to be a little bit more celebratory over the fact that the Clinton machine was stopped. That is really interesting to me. Not only stopped, but then her inner circle was exposed with this Pizzagate, spirit cooking type stuff that just never really happens. Any conspiracy enthusiast should be kicking back with the popcorn because there has been something big happening behind the scenes. But I don't want to get too crazy here. Although I would love to see Hillary sweat while she tries to explain to Monsanto, J.P. Morgan Chase, Saudi Arabia, and the rest of her big donors that their investments aren't going to yield the type of influence that they thought they might. So I just try to look at the positives here. But I'm wasting too much time. I just want to also throw out that we finally launched the Higher Side Clothing. So all new high-quality shirts with literally the best conspiratorial full-color art I've seen on any clothing, period. I met some new artists that are amazing that also happen to be listeners. So every design ties directly in with a previous Higher Side Chats episode. We got Hollow Earth stuff, we got Baphomet stuff, we got Education Conspiracy stuff. We even got J.P. Morgan, Sank the Titanic, to institute the Federal Reserve stuff. So I think you're going to love it all. TheHigherSideClothing.com or click shop on TheHigherSideChats.com. But that's a big deal for me, launching T-Shirt Company 2.0. But I got to cut the commercial short. You're wanting to hear Daniel Pinchbeck. Again, big thanks to him for spending the time with me. He's an insightful guy who's definitely been living the high life and had some huge success with his writing that you got to respect. His new book is also very well written. Even if we have a couple of minor disagreements, I like to think we're pretty aligned on the big things and both want what's best for people and the planet. So let's do the damn thing, play us in plate scrapers, and we'll be taking a dive into the mind of the great, wise, eighth wonder of the world, Daniel Pinchbeck, on the other side. Back in the park, it tune in and spark it, cause Greg's about to open up your mind. Armed with information about the secret manipulation and the wisest aficionados he can find. And he's pulling back the curtain on what we thought we knew for certain, so we can higher side chatters it seems to me that even the most dense of observers can see that we have serious problems the economic game the rockefeller rothschild reality is built on is more one-sided and unstable than ever the earth seems to be going through some serious stress while multinational companies continue to pick its bones clean without regard 
and the one-two punch of media and education has dumbed down the population and pacified our pineals so thoroughly that most of the mainstream wade through life in defeated apathy and exhausted indifference. It's a multifaceted crisis of consciousness like we've never seen, and as the proverbial train comes closer and closer to derailment, the shadowy cabal of conductors seems to have little game plan beyond full steam ahead. Well, today's guest has racked his brain, broken open the head, and ceremoniously sent his consciousness deep into the great beyond in his attempts to develop a system of solutions to the rickety runaway train we call modern society. He is the renowned author, philosopher, and psychonaut Daniel Pinchbeck, and having gotten himself on the radar with his first two books, Breaking Open the Head and 2012 The Return of Quetzalcoatl, he's laying out the roadmap to right the ship and solve many of the previously mentioned problems in his latest book, How Soon Is Now? I can't wait to dive into it, and it's a real treat to have him here just after our national exercise in false choices on this fine, fine post-election morning. Daniel, my man, welcome to the higher side. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so happy to have you here, man. We scheduled this yesterday, and then we had to postpone it, and I'm so glad we did, because I think we're both pretty shocked about Trump winning this morning. You gotta be, right? What do you think this means? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I was, for a long time during the election, convinced that he was going to win. Hmm. After seeing, I think maybe like a debate he did, uh, one of the first debates, and then you know after you know the whole sex scandals and everything, and I thought you know maybe she was going to pull it out, and I sort of got behind the the rallying around her. So yeah, it's 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 definitely in the reality of it, it's quite shocking. It really is. And I'm I'm seeing a lot of people saying that this means America is more racist than they thought or more sexist than they thought. And I, I just reject that. You could blame the DNC more than you could racism. And I know that he's said some crazy and sensitive things, but that doesn't translate to policy as much as Clinton giving six-figure speeches for banks or selling influence to corporations in foreign countries with their foundation or pushing for every conflict in the last 15 years. And I think that would be a better focus of people's attention. Reeling back the globalist agenda isn't so bad. And I think if you've cried in the last 12 hours or posted about how your heart hurts, maybe you're too attached to mainstream politics and blinded by the liberal viewpoint. But that's just me. Not that I would support either one of them, really. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I guess the fear of his demagogic rhetoric, you know, would be that there have been other situations like this that end up with a kind of dismantling of even those kind of like moderate democratic institutions that have developed in okay. centuries, you know? Yeah, totally, totally fair points. I mean, these people become, you know, dynasties like Barone and Argentina or Boastoni in Italy or whatever. But I mean, I guess, you know, I, I feel a sadness that so many people did vote for this person after everything that he's expressed. And for me, it, it really comes down to I guess in a way like a program of maybe the sort of the ruling elites in this society that sort of chose on many levels to kind of dumb down the American population, you know, starting in the, in the 60s, you know, with the great society, people getting better education, they were beginning to turn on to, you know, civil rights and psychedelic substances and so on. And, you know, under the maybe Nixon era, there was a sense that the conservatives were terrified by the direction so, you know, in a way, they pulled the funding from public schools. They created the war on drugs. Right. A number of different, you know, efforts, which have ended up really creating a, a stultified population who, you know, are, are kind of indoctrinated by this mass media that's just totally programming their minds, eating food that feeds ill health. And also being fed psychopharmaceutical drugs to keep them in, in artificial states, you know. So it feels like <laughs> Trump is like the result of 50 years of a disastrous policy. Right on. Yeah, I get what you're saying, man. And it's a false choice anyway. But if you look at the three most popular politicians of the last decade, you got Obama. Now we have Trump and I would say Sanders. And I think Sanders would have had a lot more support than Trump if that was allowed to be an option. So I think if you cut through the drama and the media hype, the point the American voters are trying to make is no more establishment politicians. It's not like most people support racism or sexist statements, but if those are aspects of the only other choice on the table, it just shows how serious people are about no more of these corrupt political dynasties. So I'm trying to stay positive. 
about the results that we've just been blindsided by? Well, I think there is the possibility that in some ways this is the best results. As hard as it's going to be for people to stomach it in the near term. I mean, you know, we saw under Barack Obama kind of like the best option for what a U.S. president can accomplish. And, you know, nothing was really done to deal. I mean, you know, from my perspective and really the perspective of my new book, How Soon Is Now? Yes. The first primary thing that, that we have to recognize is that we are, you know, on the verge of committing suicide as a species. We're on the, on the verge of bringing out about either a mega collapse of our support systems or, or even our own extinction. And we can see what's happening to the acceleration in climate change and, and the melting of the ice caps. We're losing 10% roughly of the Earth's remaining biodiversity every 10 to 15 years. You know, 100 and 150 species a day estimated going extinct out of 8.2 million total on the, on the planet. Current predictions are four degrees Celsius temperature warmer by 2100. You know, we, we know the last time there was this much carbon in the atmosphere, the temperatures were four degrees Celsius warmer and sea levels were 100 feet higher. So that's where we're headed at this point. But we also have learned that it doesn't happen incrementally, that actually it can spike and actually become for a short period much warmer. And this happens because of, you know, the deposits of methane that are frozen in the Siberian uh, permafrost and, and under the Arctic Circle and so on. And methane, uh, well, well, CO2 lasts in the atmosphere for 100 years. Methane only lasts in the atmosphere for about 10 years, but it's something like 30 times more potent as a heat-trapping gas than, than CO2, and there's something like 100 gigatons of it frozen. So the Permian mass extinction, which happened about 250 million years ago, 95% of all life on Earth went extinct, and I think it was like a half century or something once this methane erupted in large quantities. Hmm. That's, you know, on, on the precipice, like that's already, methane is already, you know, coming up. So, you know, what we saw with Barack Obama and we were, we're about to see with Hillary Clinton, you know, these are politicians who are intelligent enough, you would think, to understand that this is the critical, you know, our, our life support systems are the critical issue. I mean, and then oh, the other thing about the temperature spiking is, you know, obviously it affects, and we're already seeing forest fires all around the world that are releasing CO2, and then those, those forests only react as carbon sinks. You know, at something like four or five degrees Celsius warmer than now, that has a big impact on the plankton life cycle in the ocean. And while the forests around the world produce about 20% of the oxygen we breathe, the plankton in the ocean produce more than like 50%. So essentially, if we warm to the point where the plankton is reproducing and we've gotten rid of our forests because they dry out and burn, we don't have any oxygen left and we suffocate. We asphyxiate. So, yeah, even these seemingly, you know, rational and well-educated by the system and entrenched in the establishment, uh, politicians like, you know, Obama and Clinton have proven themselves totally useless and unable to address the underlying issues that really matter to our collective future. So in that sense, I think that. The fact that the neoliberal agenda is finally, you know, perhaps dismantled or, or, or the, the establishment around it through this election could be a good thing. And the possibility that a much more authentic, radical alternative could actually emerge, you know, is something that actually has to happen. And perhaps it can only happen in, you know, an emergency situation. Right. Yeah. And that was going to be one of my first questions for you, really, before I did end up replanning a bit of this this morning. But your book is largely about climate change, and that is probably one of the unfortunate things about a Trump win, is that we're probably going to go backwards in some of those areas a bit. Back to coal, this pipeline thing is probably going to go through, more fracking and stuff that can really do lasting damage. And I hope we don't end up with more poison and contaminants in drinking water as just one example of what can happen. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say that first of all, you know, climate change is a little bit of a misnomer. You know, it's a biospheric crisis. I mean, a much more powerful framing is, you know, the planetary boundaries model from the Stockholm Resilience Center, where climate change is only a piece of the puzzle that also includes biodiversity loss, ocean acidification. The oceans are 30 percent more acidic than they were 40 years ago because they absorb a lot of the CO2 that we're, we're emitting. And that's leading to the breakdown of the coral reefs and so on. Atmospheric pollution, you know, ozone depletion and so on. Yeah, it's just, I, I, for some, whatever reason, I kind of wince when people reduce it to climate change because I feel it's become 
one of those instant memes that sort of just falls in a kind of dead space in people's psyche almost. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, it's it's definitely been politicized and is one of those buzzwords. But yeah, I mean, you know, the question is whether this. Well, I guess what what the, the, the one of the the I mean, I can give you the basic hypotheses or ideas of the book. One is that this ecological crisis is a rite of passage or initiation for humanity. And if we're going to survive as a species, which, as I said, is kind of in doubt, you know, how, however many of us make it through, we're going to have to undergo a shift from our current state of adolescence, egotism, narcissism, to, uh, you know, collective and individual responsibility for the fate of the whole. And that's basically what initiations are about, you know, in traditional societies, like the adolescent isn't seen as a full adult until they've had a kind of transpersonal visionary experience that has enlarged the scope of their awareness. So you understand that their life is part of a larger continuum and, and actually, you know, even understanding there's a supernatural or spiritual dimension to existence that allows them to take their role in the society as a full adult. So mm -hmm. humanity, you know, the modern society did away with initiations. I mean, I was very inspired by like this German philosopher, Walter Benjamin, who talked about how, you know, humanity has this intrinsic need to have ecstatic communion with the cosmos. And if we don't manage this through culturally, you know, created rituals, then we will it upon ourselves unconsciously through wars and disasters and so on. So, I mean, I, I almost feel that the ecological crisis is something that we are subconsciously self-willing or self-creating to force to bring ourselves to transformation or transmutation or something. Mm -hmm. And that is one of my favorite points you make in the book, that the big gaping hole in modern Western society is the initiatory experience. And I think there's some weight to that. When I compare the lives of people I've known from kindergarten who have taken insight from their psychedelic experiences versus those who have lived a more sober, mainstream, career-oriented life, it does feel like there is some stunted growth with that latter group. And I'm curious just how damaging you'd consider that one action, because we could get conspiratorial about all the ways we've been affected, reducing nutrients in the food supply, dumbing us down in state-run education programs. But how much of our problems or the damage that's been done do you think can be attributed just to that source of the lost initiation? Yeah, I mean... Um... You know, I, I resist, by the way, the kind of us and they rhetoric, which a lot of sort of people on the conspiratorial left kind of fall into. I think it's much more subtle and intricate than that. But yeah, I mean, I think sometime in the early, you know, as Christianity rose to prominence, you know, up until like 400 AD or whatever, you know, there was the Lucinian mysteries that had gone on for like 2,500 years. And there was this idea that at least the sort of leaders of society, the cultural and philosophical and political leaders would come together and have an experience together that may have involved actually a psychedelic substance annually. And, you know, that idea that there needed to at least be an initiation for, you know, some percentage of the population was then, yeah, kind of shifted as we went into Christianity to an indoctrination system. So religions, monotheistic religions, are kind of moral codes you know, they're exoteric, not esoteric. They don't promote the individual having their own experience except through kind of slavish devotion or, or fealty or whatever to an elite, you know, priest class or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and so somehow, like, I think that became, you know, the, the way things were propagated, the new system. And then in a way, with the 19th to 20th century and discovery of mass media and communications tools, the whole media and communication system is like a giant indoctrination or mind programming system. And so that's kind of what we're seeing at this point is, in a way, I feel it's it's kind of interesting. I, I almost feel like with this election, you know, the, the, the part of the reckoning is going to be on the part of the media, which has been so responsible for the dumbing down of the population, for exacerbating their lowest appetites, for, uh, you know, feeding them shit, basically. <laughs> and now they've fed them so much shit that, you know, they've become shit. <laughs> Well said. And why don't we talk about that us versus them mindset and the situation we're in with the elite? Because maybe you can't draw distinct lines around us and them. And you're right that we have major problems coming, an economic crisis and an environmental one. 
But how much responsibility is the average person supposed to take? Because I think most people want world peace, equality, good natural food, and a clean environment. But we didn't start fractional reserve banking or poison the groundwater with fracking. And it does seem like it's a small group of globalists and international corporations that engineer these wars and conflicts. And it's these huge corporations that drive pollution because they don't care about ethics in their large-scale operations. And they've limited our choices. History shows that we had alcohol-based fuel and viable electric vehicles before we had our options reduced to standard oil. And we had hemp as a much more renewable resource before that was blocked by industrialists who had logging companies and wanted to make everything out of oil-based plastics. It seems like there are solutions, but they've just been kept off limits to us, and we didn't make these decisions. Yeah, I mean, you know, w w once again, I don't really think in terms of blame or fault. I'm not sure how useful that is. I, I try to understand things on a systemic level. You know, for whatever reason, um, things have things have turned out this way at the present time. And then the question is, you know, what are the tools and the strategies that could be used to, you know, bring about change to the system? Obviously, on a much deeper level than just political reform. Mm -hmm. You know, in my new book, I kind of look at it as trying to envision kind of a, a new operating system. It's almost like all of our interlocking institutions, the political, economic, the, the media, entertainment, you know, military, industrial, entertainment complex. It's all like a system, you know, that, that is also like a, it's like it has its own kind of like frequency and discourse and so on. But that operating system for consciousness, you know, for, it has kind of reached its end point. So then the question is, what's available to us as, as options for, you know, constructing a new system? Uh, and for me, like, obviously, the evolution of social technology and communications tools point towards the potential to have a rapid change. I mean, for instance, it's extraordinary that Facebook just started 10 years ago by, you know, college kid. And now it's got over a billion people using it every day. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a tool like that could be used not just for people to display their, you know, photos and, and, you know, make little updates. In theory, you know, we could use our social technologies to supplant or supersede many of the functions of the current political economic super state. Yeah, and I, I do love the new book and the roadmap you put out, the blueprint you lay out. I'm in such agreement with so many of those things. But I, and I guess I'm just cynical and I, you know, I hope that I'm wrong. But I guess my argument is, is the problem that we don't have a proper blueprint or roadmap or is the problem that we're not allowed to change it in some of those key areas that we'd want to? Uh, I mean, I, 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 I felt that. We, we first of all needed the, the blueprint of the roadmap. Um, I mean, I felt, you know, my books generally have come out of my own. It's like, it's almost like an inner sense of like discomfort or, or, or the strange sense that they're there that like, you know, I go into bookstores or look through the media and there's some missing jigsaw puzzle piece, you know, to, that doesn't, that doesn't, doesn't, and does, that, 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 where there's something important that I feel isn't really being understood properly or by me or anyone else. So that was my first book, Breaking Open the Head on Psychedelic Shamanism. You know, I'd started to have these incredibly uh, amazing visionary experiences through psychedelics and, you know, going to tribal people in Africa and so on. And I felt that there was no, there was nothing that really explained it properly that put all the pieces together, of what it could mean in terms of the history of ideas and anthropology and literature and, and so on. So that led me to write Breaking Open the Head. And the second book, 2012, similarly, then having, through the research of Breaking Open the Head, my worldview shifted from just sort of a scientific materialist cynic to recognizing that there are these kind of occult dimensions, the, the, the shamanic realms, the collective unconscious that Jung talked about. Like I had so many direct experiences of these things. I realized that the Western rational knowledge system was completely defunct in, in certain respects. And yes, that we sort of suppressed and repressed indigenous knowledge systems. We had no access to understanding their way of being and, and knowing the nature of reality. So the book was an attempt to kind of heal the knowledge system by finding the juncture points between Western thought 
uh, figures like Heidegger and Nietzsche and, and Carl Jung, Rudolf Steiner, and these indigenous understandings of the nature of, of the world, the nature of reality, and the nature of the time that we're in as being this time of prophetic change. You know, so that's always in the background of my thinking. And so having done that book, then my next sort of question was like, having understood maybe a, a different model of, of the reality that we're in, how does that then apply to the pragmatic, you know, system that has everybody kind of in its thrall? What is at the base of that system and how do we bring about its transcendence to create a world that, you know, works for everybody? I'm very much inspired by people like Buckminster Fuller, his book Utopia or Oblivion, Murray Bookchin, the social ecologist, and uh, even Oscar Wilde's incredible essay, The Soul of Man Under Socialism. Yeah, so that was kind of the point of the new book. And I do think that we need a blueprint. I mean, you know, an, an example, I mean, if we look at Milton Friedman, I don't know if you read Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine, but Milton Friedman was the lead sort of neoliberal economist who advocated for privatization and so on. And, you know, starting in the 60s or 70s, he was working with a whole group and they realized that, that they wanted to move society in a direction. But to do that was going to require kind of a um, effort. You know, and so they began to create institutions like think tanks and magazines and, and books and so on. And Milton Friedman basically said at one point that, you know, when a crisis comes, the ideas that get applied are the ones that happen to be lying around. You know, so then 1989 happens, you know, and, and other things before that, but the Berlin Wall fell and the neoliberal economists rushed in to the Soviet Union with solutions, which were privatized state owned industries essentially leading to the rise of oligarchies and, and, you know, Putin and so on. So, you know, we can see that we're already in a crisis, low-level crisis to a certain extent, but probably bigger thresholds of crisis are coming. And my idea was that just as the neoliberal economists had put out a plan that could then be applied, kind of, you know, the anarchist, spiritual, you know, echo-conscious left also needed to have more of a kind of plan that would go, okay, like, this is actually kind of something that we could work together towards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you mentioned indigenous people, and it's amazing that you have that context of actually spending time with them, because when talking about changing the system, there is a fundamental debate over the worst aspects of people, greed, selfishness, jealousy, one-upmanship, rage, all these sorts of things. And the concern seems to be how much of these traits come out of us as a result of the system we're in, and would be quelled in a different model or versus how much of this is just human nature and we're stuck with it. Did your time with indigenous people give you any insights there into how people might behave outside of the Western system? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, mean, I think, you know, the, the evidence is very strong that there really isn't any human nature as such. Human nature is very malleable and contextual and people will basically do what brings them, you know, reward in however that, you know, however that is, that is constituted. And they'll also seek to do things that have meaning, you know, that make their lives feel meaningful. You know, so in the same century, the 20th century, you had Gandhi getting millions of people in India to work, you know, in, in the Satyagraha method of nonviolent direct activism, you know, actually sitting in front of the guns and, and clubs of the colonialists going to prison to bring about a peaceful transition. And you had Hitler, you know, telling his followers to perform genocide against uh, minorities and Jews and so on. So human nature is a vast spectrum. And I think what defines human nature is, yeah, like the context and, you know, what the society values and, and considers meaningful. What One book that I discuss in How Soon Is Now is by Rebecca Solnit. It's called The Paradise Built in Hell. And she went to the aftermath of many big disaster areas. And basically what she recounted was, that when these huge crises hit, immediate crises, people actually go into a mode of extreme altruism and, and caring for each other. And suddenly the sort of egocentrism, the separation just disappears and they try to figure out how they can help their neighbor, how they can help their community. And she documents this all around the world. And yeah, so in a way, I think the political economic system, the whole operating system that we're in now, artificially exacerbates more negative psychology traits and in a way dampens down our innate altruism and compassion for each other. Absolutely. I definitely agree the system tends to bring out the worst in us, and it's great to look at indigenous cultures or 
compassion in times of disaster and see that it might not have to be that way. But on the subject of new models, you write in the book about your journey in putting this blueprint together and that it's something you got started on during your time at Burning Man. And Burning Man has a sort of societal structure I hear people discussing quite a lot as a mainstream alternative. Can you tell us a bit about the way Burning Man operates and how viable it is to you as a potential new paradigm? Do you think it could scale up or become something more permanent, maybe? Well, I mean, earlier, early in this conversation, I mentioned the uh, Mysteries of Eleusis, Eleusinian Mysteries, which were this annual gathering of the kind of society's elite in ancient Greece. I feel in a weird way, Burning Man is like this strange kind of American rediscovery of kind of the center for initiation and mystery. You know, Burning Man has many different aspects and tendencies. Over the last few years, I've also been quite critical of it. I mean, it's fascinating to me that, you know, it was kind of once, it was began maybe 30 years ago by kind of outsiders, counterculture artists, you know, maybe some like Aleister Crowley kind of chaos magicians or something. Mm -hmm. And now it's attracting the international jet set. You know, the guy who started Cirque du Soleil, the former head of MTV, you know, uh, all the Silicon Valley executives, inherited money, you know, the Ibiza crowd, the Tulum crowd. It's become kind of the playground for uh, a lot of the, the wealthiest and most entitled people on the planet who are, you know, coming there and, and exploring, you know, new modes of interaction psychedelic substances and other drugs and so on. But the tenor of it has suddenly shifted over the years in a way that I find sometimes kind of confusing. What initially fascinated me about Burning Man, why I joke in my new book that it was for me a little bit like the Paris Commune was for Marx and Engels, was that realization that, you know, essentially what I was saying before, that human nature is very much a social construction and it is very permeable and changeable. So if you give people a new set of directives that actually make their lives better, they'll adapt to those directives and, and new principles immediately without even thinking about it. You know, somebody who's been a very selfish, you know, corporate lawyer, investment banker goes to Burning Man and suddenly for them to, you know, maximize their own fun, they have to share, hug everybody, share their drugs, you know, share their RV, share their supplies. And they do that Immediately and unthinkingly, within within three days, they're wearing a pink tutu, they're cleaning up the trash all around the camp. You know, so for me, it was like a really powerful sign that that you know, given a system that rewards different behaviors, those are the behaviors that people will adapt immediately and unthinkingly. So I don't think I think we even have the slightest idea how easy it is to change human nature in that sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, well said. And you also talk about fame a little bit in the book kind of being thrust into the limelight after your last book or the last two books really and you talk about trying to influence the influencers which i think is a really worthy goal and it's amazing that you'd have that opportunity to do that you know moving in some of these hollywood circles talking to some of these silicon valley tech billionaires and just the people who have you know gravitated to you since they've read your previous work how has that process gone? Do you think you've done some good in influencing those influencers? Um, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, I, mean, I definitely feel that am among these elite groups, um, there are a number of like evolving conversations and there are a lot of people who are, you know, undergoing their own journey of self-exploration and evolution. Um, yeah, I, 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 I can't say to what extent I've, well, I, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I, I know, for instance, that I had a great influence, I, I mean, I would say, on Russell Brand, hmm. you know, because, yeah, he sought me out after he saw the documentary that I made after my 2012 book. And I think he was looking for a way to put together kind of the spiritual development he was undergoing and the kind of left wing political impulse that he had. And I think that my work, helped him yeah kind of integrate political left ideas spirituality and ecology he has he wrote a few chapters about me in his book revolution and 
we had a series of discussions. And then he also started this thing called The Trues. He was doing these daily video broadcasts. And in some ways, I felt that, you know, he took ideas that I had and, and maybe other people also had. And he was like this vast human megaphone because of his, you know, celebrity and charisma. He, he was suddenly able to get those ideas out to millions of people. And actually, it was quite amazing to see the impact of that just him alone doing videos on his own in his bathroom, in, in his home, you know, where we're creating these ripples throughout English society. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely important to spread those positive ideas to the people who can amplify the message. And you also write about, it just seems like you've also had some really fun experiences, some real uh, bucket list type of things. One I thought was pretty amazing is, uh, chartering a helicopter with Sting and his family over crop circles in England looking for extraterrestrials. That sounds uh, pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, in the, in the 2012 book, one of the uh, subjects that I focused on and actually took seriously was the uh, crop circles. I, mean, I found myself in like an interesting, um, I have you know no kind of institutional support behind me. I'm not, I'm not, beholden to any like you know academic institution or whatever so i mean after breaking open the head when i explored you know psychedelics which at that point in that book about 2002 psychedelics were still totally suppressed and ridiculed in the mainstream culture really derided you know you couldn't talk about them seriously you know in, in the media circles that i was part of in new york and you know realizing you know discovering that they were incredibly important catalytic agents for self-discovery and so on. Then seeing the gap between what our society had to say about them and, and the reality made me then be willing to question almost everything that our society says is true or holds dear. And while I was, you know, sort of looking around for maybe other correlates of the psychedelic experience uh, in the physical world, I discovered that the crop circle phenomenon was happening. And, Ended up spending a whole summer in, in England, I mean, 2003, I think it was, researching them in depth and, and going to all the new ones that appeared and so on. And uh, yeah, I probably wrote about 80 or 100 pages about them in the 2012 book. And, you know, in, in the end, I, I do actually think that it's, well, I, I guess I would say that I believe that the crop circles are, you know, some of them are a communication from a non-human form of consciousness or galactic level of intelligence that is giving us, you know, some interesting messages and ideas. Hell yeah, man. Absolutely. And that gets right into one of the weirder uh, aspects and probably my favorite line in your new book is, I have been primarily focused on the material and tangible aspects of our plight, but I think we should consider also the occult or invisible forces that may be involved. Very provocative. And the influence of unseen forces is one of my favorite things to ponder. Outside of crop circles, what are your thoughts on the extent of this otherworldly influence? Uh, in what sense? What do you mean? Well, a lot of people in the mainstream doubt it exists at all. And then you have some people, some authors like Peter Lavenda, who think that it actually plays a huge role, that there's probably spiritual forces that have little puppet strings attached to us, creating synchronicities here and there. And so there's a sliding scale between not believing it exists at all and thinking that it has quite a bit of influence over our 3D reality. I wonder where you lie on that spectrum. Um, yeah, I mean, well, I guess, um, you know, in, I mean, I, I guess in a way I, I'm sort of um, like a Vedantaist, like Eastern mysticism, which kind of ultimately argues that there's sort of one consciousness underlying everything that we experience is separate phenomena mm -hmm. constructing the illusion of the material world in order to explore its infinite, you know, creative capacities and, and, you know, abilities and so on. And there also seems to be many different dimensions of space time. According to some physicists, there's like 10 of them. And the fourth dimension that we're in is where you can have, you know, physicalized uh, materiality. We don't really know how some type of, separate entity might exist in a higher dimension but assuming it can then yeah i mean the, those higher dimensional entities could definitely be you know playing with our time and space you know rearranging it for all we know because they could pass through the past as, as well as the future 
you know, so what we're experiencing as this sort of plotting, you know, linear kind of thing where we're like these ping pong balls being like buffeted through a wind tunnel from a higher dimension, they can see the whole wind tunnel, you know, they can see the whole progression of what's happening. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it's quite you know likely that there are these other occult powers. I mean, I, I really love the work of uh, Rudolf Steiner, who's an anthroposophist. He was a visionary thinker who, when he was young, was able to see these other dimensions, what's called the Akashic Record. And he tried to elaborate like a whole spiritual cosmology with these different forces and powers. And, you know, I think, you know, you, you could look at all these different attempts to figure out occult systems. You know, they're just ways of articulation. It's not like they're, they're necessarily what is truer than the, or less true. I mean, they're, they're like interfaces, you know, of language and, and thought that help us to make sense of what might be happening. And Steiner is, is one of the people that I found very valuable for that. Yeah, fair point. And, you know, I don't want to make this about shallow things when we're talking about uh, stuff that's so epic, the nature of our reality and the crisis that we're in. But you also talk about some of those wild experiences and having the popularity and lifestyle that you've experienced. And I think a lot of people fantasize about having that and having lived it. Did you learn anything from the sudden thrust into the limelight that might be helpful for people listening? Was it different than you expected in any way? Are there any insights you could share from such a unique series of events? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't, you know, I, I, there, I, mean, I would say that, you know, I, I'm a celebrity, you know, or among certain groups, you know, I mean, not like, you know, Sting, obviously, or Russell Brand or something. Um, um well, I, I definitely learned that, and, and maybe also because my subject was so controversial and I was talking about prophecies, my own visionary experiences, I learned that one becomes the subject of a lot of projections and some of it can be very kind of, you know, hurtful and hostile and difficult to kind of integrate, you know, because you're seeing these like, yeah, different people's projections onto you and so on. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I also, I mean, it's been very interesting to me that so much about this current election has revolved around sexuality and gender. And, and I mean, you know, that's another area where I had, you know, some experience how, I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> when, you, when you're a man and you're suddenly prominent in a way, you know, you, you suddenly have opportunities that didn't exist before. And in a way, it's, it's kind of ridiculous because you're exactly the same person that you were, but suddenly, you know, women react to you in, in, in a different way. A lot of new sexual currency. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so some of the book is a kind of rumination on that. And, you know, I, I feel in some ways I had my own immaturities and kind of, you know, un, unmet desires, and dissatisfactions that sort of came out once I had opportunities I didn't have before. So, you know, it's interesting for me having had that experience, also getting some flack for it, and then seeing, you know, what's happening, what happened in this campaign with, you know, obviously Trump, Bill Clinton in the in the background and his yeah. escapades, Anthony Weiner, you know, and, 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 and Roger Ailes, uh -huh. who was the former head of Fox, who uh, just got taken down. I mean, you know, it's it's still a very intricate and delicate, you know, cultural area, and I, I think it's something that has to also, you know, we have to shed more light on it. I mean, in the book, I kind of really make a, you know, as I said, what I'm trying to do in the book is think, look at things systemically, and our culture of, you know, love and sexuality is also part of this current operating system, where it's you know competitive system. You know, I think, I think women are forced into kind of operating with a lot of anxiety and, and fear because, you know, if they're going to have children, they need to have a monogamous, you know, more or less family unit that for most of their adult lives or they're kind of left with this huge burden of childcare and so on. So in the book, I look at some other models, like mainly this community in Portugal called Tamara, which is basically a community that's seeking to you know, create a more peaceful world. And basically they believe that finding peace between the genders in, in, in love and sexuality is key to, you know, creating peace on earth. 
And they've actually developed kind of rigorous alternative social design that allows for, you know, non-possessive, transparent relationships that are founded in, in trust. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And maybe we can get into that a little bit deeper because you do talk about things in the book like evolving beyond the nuclear family model. And I think that's a pretty radical proposition for a lot of people. I think they might consider that to be a bit out there. But there are other ways of doing things, other ways to raise children and form relationships. Have you seen any other models in effect when it comes to the tribes you have spent a little time with? I mean, I'm sure you've seen some stuff, but have you noticed any differences in their relationships or child rearing and the effects on their greater society that we could contrast with how Westerners typically do things? It's actually interesting. In the, in the tribal groups that I visited, and first of all, I'm not an anthropologist. It's not like I spent like months and months like really investigating, you know, how they handle love and sexuality or whatever. I mean, I was doing pretty short visits. But, you know, I, I would say still in those cultures, for whatever reason, the, the you know, the, 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 the well, I, I can't even really say that. I, I don't have enough insight, to be honest. I mean, the Kogi and the Arawak, who I uh, worked with, there definitely were, you know, sort of seemed like very settled couples you know the, the elders were in family units if you read the book sex at dawn a very popular book on the subject they kind of review different indigenous cultures around the world who do have radically different practices you know some that guarantee sexual freedom to young girls and young women and so on in china and so on and they argue that in, in nomadic tribal societies sexuality was mostly looser looser and multi-partner relationships were, were often common, you know, so, so I, I think it was just looser that I feel this like stricture of, you know, possessive monogamy developed, you know, because it was necessary to support a regime of property rights and, and, and somehow yeah. a, a uh, you know, a whole, a whole repressive uh, culture. You know? Yeah. Oh, I get that. For us, marriage is as much a business partnership as anything. Economics seems to be the most popular reason for divorce and the most popular reason to stay together. Uh, but another thing that you talk about in the book is the ridicule you received post-2012. And I definitely believe that. When I made mention that I was having you on, I got several responses that were like, oh, the 2012 guy? And it is a little shitty to reduce someone down to just one thing. But you no doubt rose in the counterculture because of that book. I'm curious how you feel about 2012 now. Looking back, do you see that it was a period of change? Is it a window that's still open? Did Quetzalcoatl make a return? Well, I mean, I, I honestly, you know, completely stand by everything that I wrote in the book, which I just feel, you know, pe people created, um, once again, a projection, you know. Right. Without actually having done the work of reading what I say or watching the film, 2012 Time for Change, which came out in 2010, a few years after the book. And basically what we, we argued in that film was like, you know, these prophecies are pointing towards this being a time of incredible transformation. If we look around, we see that's happening. You know, on the one hand, we've created a planetary civilization where we're totally connected. On the other hand, we're having this rapid evolution of technologies, particularly communications and social tools. And then we've also poisoned the planet and are causing this ecological meltdown. And then also the, the sort of realization that all these esoteric and mystical traditions around the world are, are very congruent with each other and actually also, you know, mesh well with discoveries in, in quantum physics, contemporary discoveries in, in, in science. So for me, those are all aspects of, of this emergent, you know, new, new situation. Right. I never said that December 21st, 2012 was going to be anything. I couldn't rule out that, you know, something might happen, you know, solar flares or something, but it, it seemed more like the, the, the long count calendar was pointing towards, yeah, the completion of a cycle, the beginning of a new time, a liminal space. Maybe we're, we're walking between the worlds, which is maybe where, where we're in right now. But it was very saddening for me to see not only the mainstream media, kind of intentionally distorting what I had to say, but then also people just, you know, being ready to accept those distortions and dismiss the work without, without actually looking at it. It's got to be frustrating to have, you know, your deep thoughts reduced to just a few sentences, but that's why I mention it as a window because it was about 
was and is about more than just a particular day. But, you know, being four years past that point, do you think it has been the type of transition you expected? Have things unfolded as you might have thought? Or does it seem like we're kind of going full steam ahead the direction we were going? And obviously that's not good. Yeah, I mean, you know, individually among many people that I meet and, and that I know and that I, I care about, you know, I feel there's a lot of evolution and, and development and awakening. You know, I, I suppose that I, I, my, my, you know, hope or prayer would have been that um, there would have been a larger social process of reckoning with the destructive nature of our current society. And it does seem instead, you know, as, as the Trump victory uh, now even suggests, that that is just full steam ahead. And, you know, it, it leads me to wonder, yeah, what the eventual endpoint will be. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe humanity is not meant to be on the earth much longer in physical form. You know, maybe, maybe we're going to undergo a collective catastrophe that will push us all together on the astral plane and we'll have to work things out in a, in a, in a different dimension or something. I mean, I, I have no clue how things will unfold, but I, I do tend to think that, you know, uh, success of Trump is somehow part of the prophecy and so kind of like overtly almost like, like, like a, like a dream event, you know, like the Trump card being played. Yeah. You know, the Joker in the deck or something. So we're kind of now in this real, you know, we're in this liminal zone. We're walking between the worlds and that might be a, a 10 or 15 or 20 year process before we get from one to the next. You know, I have had the feeling or the belief I put it out as an idea that there's kind of a shift in the nature of the psyche happening where people who are sensitive and open to it are finding that reality is a little bit more psychically malleable than before, that things like synchronicities and telepathic events and so on, you know, happen with more ease and with more frequency, almost as if the whole, the whole field of the psyche is evolving or, or amping up. You know? Mm-hmm. And I do love how you equate this to a collective rite of passage. I mean, I think symbolically that makes a whole lot of sense. But the thing that, you know, I, I would never deny climate change. I'm not definitely not one of those guys like the one who just got elected. But can we even parse out how much of it is from us and how much of it is part of a natural cycle? Because, you know, you'll hear people say, oh, well, we haven't had this much CO2 in 150 million years, well, we weren't driving cars then. Or you can say, oh, you haven't had this kind of methane since 250 million years ago. Well, that that kind of stuff makes me think it's part of a natural cycle. I, I really, I'm, I'm not educated enough to know, but acknowledging that things are changing, how do we parse out what we've been able to influence and what's kind of bigger than us? Yeah, well, so, there, you know, I, I definitely feel, I mean, that, that's, that's, you know, I mean, there's a few levels there. I mean, um, you know, on one level, there there are people, you know, uh, sort of on on the leftist or the conspiratorial, you know, side, who are dubious about the impacts we're having on the planet, and having really looked into it, and you know, being open to conspiratorial ideas and so on. But you know, having studied as much as I could, and it, it feels pretty ironclad. Like the science feels pretty decisive. You know, parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere equate to a heat trapping effect that, you know, changes conditions. That we're putting a million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere every hour through our industries and planes and cars. And that's having a, a big impact. You know, the ocean acidification, the entire world's oceans, giant body of water are 40%, sorry, 30% more acidic than they were 40 years ago. So 40% more sitting than they were 30 years ago, I think it is. And that's because they absorb a huge amount of this excess CO2 that we're creating. And that's leading to all sorts of breakdowns in, in, in the ocean life cycle. So, you know, th these are now very measurable things. And I find it quite strange that people who are on like this kind of conspiratorial progressive left have this sort of cryptic, almost desire to not believe anything in the mainstream story and, and to dismiss this stuff in a way. Now, Yes, at the same time, I mean, I guess in a way, one thing that I argue in the book is that, you know, we believe that we've separated from nature. We believe that somehow we're above or outside of nature, but actually we're not. We, we are totally 
nature doing its thing, you know, just on, a, on another level. And so, you know, we look around the whole solar system and there seems to be different changes taking place, like planets developing atmospheres and, you know, I think Jupiter lost one of its spots and so on. I mean, there, you know, one, one theory according to this Russian cosmophysicist, Dmitriev, is that the whole solar system is going through an energetic uh, transition to a higher energy state. Right. Okay, because we're passing through a band of, you know, cosmic energy or something. And it may be that this, you know, rapid industrialization, the super push towards hyper technologies is just how humans are transducing this larger frequency effect that's happening in the cosmos around us. Now, mm-hmm. having said that, it's still the case that we're the ones who are emitting and transforming and destroying, you know, the, the Earth's natural ecology. And if we do want to have a tenure on this planet, we have to stop doing that. We have to figure out how we use our intellects and our technical capacities to create a different system, a regenerative system that actually replenishes the biodiversity and the strength of the Earth's systems. So mm-hmm. I don't think there's a contradiction there. It's just, it's like what I, what I really looked into in the 2012 book is, you know, when I think about what, you know, if I say there's a change of consciousness or like, you know, the emergence of a new consciousness, the, the subtle aspect of it is kind of the ability to handle both sides of a paradox or a contradiction without collapsing too diametrically into one or the other. You know, holding the space of paradox is part of that new consciousness. So recognizing that, you know, as much as the ecological crisis is totally a, a man-made thing, you know, it's also part of a, of a larger natural and cosmic process. I would see as one of those contradictions that we can dissolve. Right on. And I wouldn't argue the data of change in the climate environment is ironclad, but I am one of those people who's skeptical of the interpretation. But let's say for the sake of argument that it is all man-made. What, what, you, what, are you, what are you skeptical of? I'm skeptical of anything that's really this politicized, but I've had uh, one guest, Randall Carlson, who is a a pal of Graham Hancock's, and he's very blunt about the fact that the International Tribunal on Climate Change, when it was put together, that think tank, they were given the mandate to say, find some science that supports the idea that this is all man-made. And so they latched on to the CO2 argument. And this is just the impressions from Randall Carlson, who is a, a smarter guy than me, but I do think there's the possibility to twist science and and do things like this carbon tax program. I think that's uh, kind of a Western play to keep the other nations from catching up to us quite as well, because now that we've had the benefits of doing whatever the hell you want to the environment, now we're going to cap some things to keep you in a lower place. I think those are possibilities. I'm I'm open-minded to a lot of the stuff, but... I I would separate out. I think that we have to be, you know, once again, you know, if we're going to get out of this disaster that we're in, we actually have to learn how to think clearly or more clearly than we've been able to think up till now. And and for me, there was a little bit of a conflation there. Of like, you know, there's climate science on the one hand, and then there's carbon taxation, which is a political method or a political economic technique to try to deal with what we've, you know, unleashed. Mm-hmm. In, in a way, I mean, my understanding of the carbon taxation, and I'm not an expert on it, is that, you know, we would be... Um, you know, by, by taxing carbon, it would ultimately have an impact. It would make companies more careful in their use of it, more willing to pay to, to store it or to uh, create carbon sinks and so on. You know, and if it worked properly, it would have a benefit for the developing world. However, um, you know, it, it's critiqued because essentially within this political economic system, everything ultimately becomes about growth and about profit. So if you create a market for CO2 in a way that could have a perverse impact, where it actually values CO2 pollution and, and rather than helping to reduce it, it, it almost just allows it to perpetuate as people buy these, these you know, create these perverse uh, subsidies and so on. Mm-hmm. And those are great points. And I, and I support doing things cleaner and more sustainable, period, honestly. Like I would rather move to solar and wind and you know, zero point energy and whatever else might be out there, regardless of if we're really having the impact or not, because you can see a smog cloud over LA and you don't want that, you know? So I definitely support doing things cleaner regardless. But earlier you had mentioned that we we should get past the blame, but isn't it important to call out the exact companies that have caused some of these problems if it is man-made? Monsanto, Dow Chemical, Standard Oil, BP. I mean, shouldn't we call them out specifically rather than being vague about it? 
Um, yes, I mean you can call them out specifically, but, but I, I don't I don't really see what what you know. I mean, don't we have to dismantle Monsanto to actually like solve the food problem? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're going to have to figure out how we, you know, engineer a, 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 a redesign of, of what's currently the corporate system. Um, and and, and I, I think it's a, it, it's a, yeah, I mean, um, you know, once again, I, I give you this model of like operating systems or something. Another, another, one of, one of the main ideas in the new book is, um, you know, we could look at, ourselves, humanity, the human species, as being on the cusp of dis- realizing or discovering that we're actually a gigantic planetary superorganism. You know, we are actually in a symbiotic relationship with the Earth's ecology as a whole system and, you know, should be acting as, you know, symbiotic expressions, you know, of, of the Earth's ecology rather than as just, you know, individual, over-individuated consumers and so on. And if we think about things in those terms, if we think about humanity as a whole and its relationship to the Earth as a planetary superorganism, then, you know, we, we, we can ask what are the organs of that superorganism? And in a strange way, I think that, that corporations are actually like the uh, organs of, of the superorganism. Um, mm-hmm. You know, in the human body, you know, we have the blood system, you know, we have the lungs, we have the brain, we have perceptual mechanisms. You know, similarly, I feel like multinational corporations are kind of the nascent organs in the collective body of humanity. So an energy company is very much like the blood, right? It's, it's taking fuel and bringing it across the world to where it needs to go. Uh, a media company is like the perceptual mechanism that, you know, the part of the brain that kind of takes in sense data and then converts it into narratives and, and memes that then, you know, allow us to react. And do things in relationship to that information. So, you know, a sanitation company, a waste company would be like the kidney or the liver, like breaking down our waste products. You know, one of the books that I talk about a lot in the new book, one of my references is a book called Spontaneous Evolution. That was by a cell biologist, uh, an epigeneticist, Bruce Lipton, and a political philosopher, Stephen Behrman. Yeah, they basically argue that if we step back and we look at the history of evolution on the planet, what we actually see is a constant movement towards more complex levels of cooperation and that our own bodies are a good example of this. You know, our bodies were once these microorganisms, you know, one cell organisms that were competing with resources, consuming, consuming each other in, in vast quantities. And in a crisis, they began to learn to work together to create more cl- complex organs like skin and bones and, and eyes and so on. And, and in a way, you know, once again, we can see that humanity is kind of like that. You know, when we make a satellite dish, you know, it's like, it's like basically we're coming together to build like a new kind of eye or something, you know, to observe the other worlds or observe our world or whatever. So, yeah, so, so maybe we're on the cusp of this crisis that's going to force what are now called corporations to become more like cooperative, transparent uh, infrastructure, uh, you know, of the collective body. That would be the logical implication from my perspective. You know, what, what is the process by which we get there and how much, you know, immiseration and chaos and destruction is required before we get there is, is really for me a question of how fast people can, you know, sign on to a new approach and, and a new idea and figure out how to tangibly manifest it. Mm-hmm. You do make great points. And just to tie this back to the idea of initiatory experience missing from our society One roadblock is people do fear the unknown. Like I know so many people who might be in a soulless job, working a nine to five they don't care about. And you bring up some of these ideas like, you know, a Venus Project Society or something similar, something maybe more uh, advanced. But these radical different ideas, even though these people are living paycheck to paycheck, largely screwed and unhappy, the idea that there's a chance it could be worse. Like they fear that. And I think that does go back to the lack of initiatory experience because that kind of promotes adventurism, promotes confronting the unknown. And some people are paralyzed. Do you think that plays a role? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and, and that's once again, maybe why on some subconscious level, you know, rather than dealing, you know, with the ecological situation, we've let it get to this critical point. 
you know, so that ultimately everybody is going to be forced out of their comfort zones. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, Daniel, it's been great talking to you. Your optimism is starting to rub off on me. So that's a good thing because I'm a jaded, broken man. (laughs) (laughs) I know the feeling, Greg, believe me. (laughs) (laughs) So before we really wrap this up, tell people where they can get more Pinchback if they want to follow up on your work after hearing this in the new book. Yada yada, I got Twitter and uh, Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff. And I have a website for the book, howsoonisnow.info and my own website, pinchback.io. So they can go and they can, you know, register for email newsletters, I'm getting to kind of float ideas, uh, you know, that, that, that were inspired by the book and so on. And the book itself will be out in uh, February. Right on. Well, thanks again for talking to me. I did love the book and we are entering a, a radical new change today, but keep fighting the good fight, man. Yeah. Good talking to you. Peace. Have a great day. You too. Sweet Jesus, people. Daniel Pinchbeck in the house. I got to say, I do have mixed feelings about this one. I feel a little guilty or bad for being so combative. Everyone has their own opinions and I should be able to have mine, but I felt like I drew more out of his book that I took issue with and focused on that rather than what I liked about it. And that's kind of shitty. A lot of times I give people a pass on our disagreements and I focus on where we're aligned. These people spend a lot of time and effort writing books. I'm not that disciplined. And then they're kind enough to come on my show when a guy like Daniel can get on all kinds of shows. He gives me two hours of his time, and I don't know. There's a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth. In my defense there, though, Daniel's people sought me out and asked if he could come on the show, and I agreed. So it's not like I sought him out to start a fight. (laughs) But there is a dance to this semi-press circuit, if you could call it that. These aren't supposed to be commercials, but to the guests, they kind of are. And I was in such a weird headspace, too, with the election results being so fresh. And again, I don't want anyone to interpret my comments as excitement over Trump winning. It's more excitement over the unexpected result. More excitement over Hillary losing, you know? Not only losing, but her whole network's biggest secrets were leaked by somebody. Someone in the shadows sort of played their trump card, no pun intended. That, to me, is exciting. The media's got everybody focused on how Trump emboldens racists. But six months ago, many of us would have said the most pressing issue was stopping the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and it stopped. I mean, holy shit, right? Can we focus on that instead of a small percentage of racists who have projected their ideas onto this guy? Plus, he's already reeling back on so much shit. He's not going after Clinton. That was like his big thing. Lock her up, lock her up, special prosecutor and all that. He's walked back his complete repeal of Obamacare. Instead, he's talking about tweaking it, which I actually think is fine. The cost of medical coverage in this country is insane. Of course, you don't want the government limiting your options to just the companies that they deal with and all that stuff, but something's got to be done. My point is, there's a lot of hyperbole on the campaign trail, and this is what always happens. It comes back to the center, so don't be fooled. All this paranoia over this little issue or that one, just relax until something actually happens. Don't get yourself all worked up. Although his cabinet picks are supremely shitty. But hey, it's a false choice between two shitty candidates. I'm trying to find silver lining. And I hear a lot of, well, that's easy for this cis white male to say relax. What about Muslim Americans who are scared their family overseas isn't going to be able to visit? Or the Mexican family who's afraid deportation is going to split them up? Well, first of all, if you're a Muslim American with family in the Middle East... Hillary Clinton, as president, is the last thing you want. She's the Middle East meddler. She's the war hawk. Yeah, she'll smile and be polite while she drone strikes the shit out of your homeland. Trump may be rude and insensitive, but he talks like an isolationist. He talks like a nationalist who wants to focus on America, be left the fuck alone, and leave other people the fuck alone, too. Maybe we're going to claw back the American empire. Isn't that what a lot of us have been talking about and wanting for so long? Less war, less intervention? I mean, that's kind of what we got. Or or what we voted for. Who knows what we're going to get? We know a lot of those choices are off the table. But that's what I would say to a Muslim family, though. 
you don't want Clinton. And this election was, to me, a bit of a war between actions and feelings. If you focused on actions, they're both dicks, but Clinton is more dangerous and her crimes are more in the government realm rather than the business world. And these sectors have to be treated differently. So I think it makes Clinton's crimes and corruption much worse than some shady businessman who's not supposed to have your best interest at heart. But if you focus on who's more polite, which I think is a bad way to look at it, then of course you're breaking down over a Clinton loss. But again, don't be fooled. And as for the Mexican thing, I, I've said before, I know it sounds a little one world governmenty, but I think we should all have open borders, at least for travel. Logistically, it seems like a nightmare, but it is just so arbitrary and stupid. All these artificial lines and red tape just to travel around this planet. I mean, this planet is humanities, right? Shouldn't we be able to explore it freely to some degree? So that is kind of my angle on that. But hey, I live like 20 minutes from the border. I don't see a problem. And if I was born on the south side of that imaginary line where I had no infrastructure, no resources, you bet your ass I would try to get across and get some shit job that pays $10, $20 an hour under the table, washing dishes, working in some kitchen, and support my family and myself, because that would be the best option. So I don't blame anyone who does that. But if you come into a country illegally, I mean, that's a risk, and there would be consequences if you get caught. As an example, I speed all the time. And if I get caught, I just say, well, that sucks. I knew the risk. There's a consequence. This is how the game is played. It sucks. I think we should take any money and energy we put into securing our border and probably help Mexico make their society, government more fair, give them a little better infrastructure so that people don't need to come here. They don't want to come here. It's all driven by economics. And then you got people saying they want to move to Canada because of such a racist policy. But good luck, because Canada has the type of immigration laws that you're running from in those cases. And when you look at the World Happiness Index, it's those countries like Iceland, Sweden, Norway that have the best quality of life. And they also have really strict immigration because their, their system has to be self-contained. I get all that. Maybe I'm sounding very conventional, but there's just a lot of irrational talk going around right now that the media is just leading people around by the nose. But in a nutshell, I wish we all had small local governments everywhere, but free travel. And I know you can't really have everyone flocking to nice areas or the system with the best benefits, but I still want to be able to go to China as easy as I can go to Florida. It's not so much about ruling everybody under one government umbrella, it's just more about being a little less paranoid and a little more friendly. And maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but no corporations. That's another one. What a stance, huh? Can anybody find a flaw with that? If every company had to have an owner who was accountable for their company and their actions, wouldn't that solve a lot of problems? Would it create problems that I'm not seeing? Probably. I don't know. But that was another issue I had with Daniel is that he says, we need to make these changes to save the planet, and he doesn't see how blame is useful. Well, we have to be honest about how we got here and who did it and who is going to have to be held accountable or at least not allowed to continue fucking things up, right? Here's a decent example. The California drought. Regular people are being told not to water their gardens, actually being fined over their water usage. Meanwhile, no restrictions whatsoever on big aggro on these huge corporate farms all over the state Reports were showing that they were using like 75% of the state water. Well, what people use is a fraction of that. But we're getting the blame and we're getting the fines. And then Nestle is trying to privatize water. Turns out they were stealing water when their permit expired like a decade ago. So if we put the blame where it belongs and the fines and restrictions where they belong, we could do much more to fix the problems, in my opinion. You can change your light bulbs out all day, take shorter showers all day. It's a symbolic gesture compared to the real damage that's being done by these giant mega international corps. I do appreciate Daniel's dedication to making a plan, a blueprint for a better world. He's a positive guy, but that assumes the problem is that we don't have a plan. And I think the problem is we're not allowed to act on plans and ideas and technologies that have been there for decades. 
So I feel like there's a little subtle misdirection there, probably unintentional, but I was a bit of a stickler on those points because I think they're important if we're being serious about real change. We want the same things, me and Daniel. We just slightly disagree on how to get there and what is most important along the way. That's all right. But the system will always blame the people when it's usually big corporations captained by the nefarious elite that have the resources to do that real damage. Just like they try to say it's all the people on welfare sinking the economy, when really it's the goddamn fractional reserve system, the debt-based system of rule that has us all chasing green paper and uses poverty as a weapon. But it's always about blaming the people instead of looking at the real mechanisms that are kicking us in the collective dick. Are you and I cutting down the rainforest? Are we dumping millions of gallons of oil in the Gulf of Mexico? But hey, I'm young and angry and cynical and probably naive. And maybe Daniel is just a little more evolved, zen, and forward-thinking than me. Who's to say? But ultimately, I did enjoy his book. Even reading things we might disagree with is a great thing. And I do love his input in the realm of psychedelics and the lack of the Western initiation. I am on that page for sure. So do check it out if you're interested or hit Daniel up and tell him you liked the show and it was worth his time and he made great points. I gotta say, Russell Brand wrote his intro, Sting wrote his forward, so he knows some wheelers and dealers who have a lot more respect for his opinions than they do mine. <laughs> of course, in the Plus show, we got deeper into this stuff. If you liked the first free hour, sign up for the second if you agree with my contentions here. Also, the HiresideClothing.com New amazing shirts with artwork based on episodes of this show. I'm willing to bet we have the best, most fashionable Hollow Earth shirt on the goddamn planet. And maybe the only J.P. Morgan sank the Titanic to institute the Federal Reserve shirt. And an amazing Archon design. And nine other ones. There's a goddamn dozen of them. The HiresideChatsClothing.com. Check it out. So that's it. I'm going to stop rambling. I'm probably showing my ignorance, and you really can't solve the world's problems in a simple five-minute wrap-up to a podcast. And my opinion only matters so much on this show, typically. Usually it's about absorbing the perspectives of different people, and I hope some of us did that today. Thanks to Daniel for being here. I, I think I could also hear in his voice that I, I'm not sure he felt that great, so maybe that was part of the thing, too. Either way... Enough of my qualifying Jesus. I hope you were entertained and enlightened, and I will see you next time. I've done my part. Your move, humanity. Your fucking move. Lucid dreams are so vivid, cause you go to bed at seven, and your brain comes alive, cause you hate your nine to five. You wake up with a dread, and make sure your cats are fed. Did your brain talk to a ghost? Who moved your coffee and your toast as you listen to the higher side chats? You get to your desk and your boss says it's a mess And your soul slowly grows to a place where nothing grows When you think he's not around, you insert a steady sound The OM says turn it down and you say it's just the higher side chats Oh, do you think you'll be invited to Bohemia Grove to a Bilderberg Club? Oh, do you think you'll be invited by a Rothschild to a party on a submarine Diving down to the center of the earth Through the Marianas Trench Your teeth begin to clench from the sulfurous stench The mask you're given doesn't fit Cause you're not one of them Starting today, you'll make plans to get away There's no one to hold you down, and the what-ifs start to drown Then you wake to the glare of a cold fluorescent stare And the light winks at you, cause its life is almost through But it's holding on to quit time just like you It's time for the high side chats Hey 
guys. Thanks for listening to the first hour of the Higher Side Chats podcast with me, Greg Carlwood. If you don't know, there is a second hour to all the episodes we do around here. Generally, we're able to get a lot deeper into the topics and ideas that a guest is about. So if you enjoyed what you've heard from THC for free, consider signing up at thehiresidechatsplus.com to get the second hour of the five shows I put together each month. I never really wanted to be a paid subscriber podcast, but I really hate the idea of spending airtime promoting some product that's completely unrelated and telling you the best way to support the show is to buy an audiobook or new underwear by mail or something crazy like that. So instead, if you like the show, double your time with it for five bucks a month and let's cut out all the other shit. It's half the price of a movie ticket and you get at least an extra five hours of show a month. Collectively, it keeps us stable and it frees me from wasting your time with anything but the show you came to listen to. It's really the only way for an independent one-man show to make it, and I do what I can so that it's worth your while. Since we started this, I've always tried to use the subscriptions to improve the podcast and make signups more advantageous. It started with just a second hour for the main show, but now we've got a nice forum going where people can get deeper in conversation about the episodes with other listeners submit a candidate in the guest request thread, or share their own personal projects to get out of the soul-crushing 9-to-5 cog-in-the-wheel life on the entrepreneur's thread. The forum and the plus comments are always the first places I try to go for listener engagement, but it does get harder as the show gets more popular. Because of that, there's also a direct messaging feature that you can use to reach me through the plus site also. But beyond the form, if you like any of the music I've used for THC, most of it I've hired artists to make, and I provide it all as free downloads to Plus members too. So if you like a particular song you've heard close the show out recently, come get the MP3. I should also mention that if you don't like the idea of paying $5 recurring every month, I get that. You can buy three months, six months, or a year up front and just be done with it. I have plenty of listeners who send checks and money orders to the P.O. Box too, I try to make it as easy for people as I can, and you can read more about it on the sign-up page. Also, be sure to check out the FAQ help page on the Plus site. If you have any questions or concerns about how to listen to a password-protected show on your devices, I've highlighted a lot of great solutions, and one of those would be the iPhone app that just recently hit the Apple App Store. A super kind and talented listener made it for us, and you can use it to stream or download either the free or the Plus show. If you're on Android, I'd use Pocket Casts or Podcast Addict and subscribe to the feed manually that way. I also try to throw in occasional bonus shows or Q&A shows, and I've got a few other weird ideas I might get to try out soon. But I give you all I can for five bucks, and I hope you'll at least give it a shot if you've listened to a few free shows and you find them unique or valuable. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there, and I'm just one of them. But if you have any questions, concerns, or comments about any of this, please get in touch with us at the Higher Side Chats team at gmail.com. I also wanted to plug the Higher Side newsletter I'm going to be putting out totally free for anyone who wants to sign up at the main internet website for the show, thehiresidechats.com. You can also get on that email list through the Higher Side Chats Facebook page. There's a button there as well. But the reason I'm doing this is because I get tons and tons of emails after a show goes up asking me about how I feel about a particular guest or topic, and the wrap-up isn't always the best place to do that, especially if I have anything negative to say. Sometimes the dust needs to settle, sometimes I need to hear feedback from you guys first. There are a lot of factors, but I usually have something to communicate to you, and I just don't get to do it. So on the first of the month, I plan to send out a little newsletter with my thoughts about the five shows the previous month, and talk to you about anything else that's on my mind or that's going on. And what's probably most enticing is that I'm going to give you some insight into at least one guest I have coming up in the month, which people have been begging for some posted schedule for a long time. I personally think I'd like the surprise. But sign up for the Higher Side newsletter. It's free. It comes out on the first of the month, and I won't waste your time with any other emails. And that's it. I appreciate you listening. I try to give alternative ideas and guests a fair shake on a high-quality podcast, expose some deep-level conspiracies without the yelling, and I hope to offer some inspiration that even though the system relentlessly suggests you should follow their blueprint to mediocrity, you can do your own thing and live a much happier life despite all the negativity in the world. So go ahead and treat yourself. Isn't it about time?